a podcast called Strangest Fruit. Welcome everybody today. This is the birth of the Compton Innocence Initiative. Um, we've all traveled here and got here through different journeys. Um, each of us are here in a different capacity, but at the end of the day, we're here for one single reason, that's to bring home Lamont Kellum Jr. and Christopher Stone. We welcome their families today, we welcome their mothers, we welcome their friends. This is our singular goal right now at this moment. They're innocent and they're, they're in prison in a terrible environment. Uh, we're gonna hear today um, the impact that it has on families, the impact that it has on friends. I'm not an expert in law or anything. Um, I did spend 29 years incarcerated. I've been out for a year and a half, so I do know prisoners, I know prison yards, I know when dudes are bullshit, and I know when they're telling the truth. I believe wholeheartedly in Chris Stone and Lamont Kellum Jr. So thank you. Uh, I welcome everybody here and I thank you guys for coming. So this is. So first, unless, uh, did Dante, you have anything? You wanna? Well, before my phone went dead, I had the numbers. Well, good afternoon, good evening. How's everybody doing? Hope Glad everybody got here safe. Big thanks to Cal State and their criminist department. Um, am I saying that right? Criminology. Cr crimin criminology <laughs> is. Yes, that's one of those days I cannot get out. It's a tongue twister. Um, countless hours, countless minutes, days, years, seasons, holidays, basketball games, football games, walks in the park, walks on the beach, sitting in silence. These men have lost that. It's gone. Seeing their daughters and their kids and their mothers go just the day by day things that we just, we really don't care about because we live it every day. They don't get to have that. Um, coming from Compton, I know what it is. I know what it's like but I can never be able to explain to you what it's like to be sitting inside prison for something that I did not do. I, on the other hand, committed every single crime that I did. I'm guilty. These men, it's not there. It's not there at all. It's to the point that it's, it's so aggravating, so aggressively blatant into the face of everybody that a person with me with just basic common sense can make points that lawyers, judges, district attorneys, and the people that are professionals could not do it. But everything comes full circle. Now, it's the people's time. And we work from the bottom, and we climb all the way up, step by step, foot by foot. If they say you're not a professional, nobody in this room is more of a gang expert than me, Brian, this man, that man, that man, that man, that man, and that man. You can't tell me anything about gang life, and I probably would know it. I knew the street signs and the street gangs before I knew the street signs themselves. Oh, that's Rosecrans. No, that's where such and such gang is. Um, another big thanks to the professors here, the students here. I went in there and seen the labs. I'm amazed. I'm amazed. I, I, I wouldn't know how to pronounce anything in there or connect any type of natural human element in my life, but it felt like I walked through a Discovery Channel episode in that thing. <laughs> and then I'm going right back and I'm sending Lamont messages. What's, what's, what's Chris got going on? Mom does not want to be sitting up here in front of all these people, but I'm, I'm going to keep her comfort. And I put on a suit for all this, and this suit symbolizes something. When I went down and looked it out, I said, what am I going to do to make something that's a statement? You know, we get a bad rap in Compton, South Central, Long Beach, Watts. You know, we the bad guys. We don't know how to act. We're going to be the first person they blame. But I have on blue, I have on burgundy, I have on white, and I have on brown. Because I'm going to walk with my brown brothers. If we got a side that's over here that need to make some peace going on, I'm going to go to the red team. If it's the blue guys I need to holler at, I'm going to holler at the blue guys. And I ain't got no problem with my white folks out there. We're going to stand there together because it takes all of us to make this happen. 
Everybody is a piece of this ultimate recipe for success, and that's to get these men home, and then further the history that they're gonna make. So I thank you, and the next people that come up on the segue, who would that be? Yeah, we'd like to invite up to speak the Cal State LA Innocence Project. Project my voice. Can you guys hear okay in the back? Yeah. Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, so welcome to the Hillsborough Davis Forensic Science Center. My name is Kathy Roberts and I'm the Deputy Director of the California Forensic Science Institute. So this facility is actually an operational forensic science lab. So they, depending of course on what floor you're on, they analyze physical evidence in this building for the entire jurisdiction of LA County. Wow. So there's a lab or two above us, a lab or two below us. Uh, but on this particular floor, this is the academic floor, and we have a bunch of different academic programs where we actually train future forensic scientists. So that's our role. We have uh, a mission within CFSI that I run, and that mission is multidisciplinary. So we, for example, in our programs, we train our students in research development, we have professional training, we have student support activities, and we also have community engagement, which is basically what we're doing tonight, engaging with the community. Uh, so in terms of our role with our students, what we're doing with our students is really serving the university, we're serving our profession, and we're also serving the justice community. For me in particular, uh, I, I have a passion for using my scientific knowledge for the greater good and trying to instill that every day in my students too. It's very important sure. for us and it's actually fitting too that we're hosting this with the Centre for Engagement, Service and the Public, Public Good. Uh, that is Hapney Lynn's organisation, Project Rebound. I know there are some students or staff in the audience, but it's very fitting that we're working with them Tiffany couldn't be here today, but I believe that she's listening uh, through the live stream. So thank you uh, for co-hosting this, Tiffany. Uh, my contact information is on the board, um, Kathy Roberts, CalCityLA.edu. And you can always Google California Forensic Science Institute. My email is there. If you have any other questions on what we do, please feel free to reach out to me if you want. Um, I gave a tour, a very brief tour, but I can do an extended version too two-minute version, I do the 10, 20, 30-minute version, depending on how interested you are in what we do. Uh, so with that, I'm going to introduce my colleague uh, in uh, fighting wrongful convictions, Paula Mitchell. She's the director of the Los Angeles Innocence Project. Thank you so much for coming out and for caring about this really, really important issue. Uh, improving the criminal justice system, making sure horrific injustices are corrected, and all the people need to come home. So I'm Paula Mitchell. I'm the director of the Los Angeles Citizens Project. I um, have been doing this work for a little over eight years. And with my incredible team, my attorneys in that, Hillary Page Eliza, we have had 13 people convicted of murder and other serious Combined, these people spent almost 300 years in prison for crimes they did not commit. So I uh, know that there are no exact numbers of how many people we think are still uh, incarcerated who are innocent, but it ranges from 40,000 to 100,000 across the country. The system is wrong far, far more than we think. So at the project, uh, we focus hard on making sure exonerees are part of our, our program. And we, we have as policy advisors people who have lived experience, people who were wrongfully convicted and are now home. And one of the most beautiful men is Frankie Pio. He's one of our policy advisors. We don't just try to get people out, we try to make sure the system changes for the better so that it stops happening. And by listening to people like Frankie, going to Sacramento, talking to the le state legislators, trying to get them to understand that we need changes in the law to help prevent this from happening going Really can broaden our impact. So we are grateful for all of your interest. I want to say about 
Dr. Kathy Roberts. I called her up about five years ago. I was desperate. I was in a time crunch. I needed to apply for some funding because we're a nonprofit and we have to raise every penny we spend. I called her and I said, will you help us with this grant? And she said immediately yes. And ever since then, we have been receiving cases involving DNA and other forensic problems and we learn from each other. And her students learn from us and uh, our staff attorneys and all of everybody on our team learns from them. So it's been a really great partnership. We, um, we are working on some really tough cases. Our project is the only uh, project in California that takes cases from death row. We work on uh, the very, very, very hardest cases that other projects turn down. And in fact, I think almost everybody we brought home was somebody who was turned down by other projects. So we don't shrink from the hard work it is incredibly difficult. As everybody knows who's trying to get a, a wrongful conviction in return, it's that easy. They, they want it to be final, and you have to dig up some really, really good stuff in order to get the court's attention and to get that case overturned. So we're here as a resource for, for everybody in the community who needs help, and we're happy that this uh, Compton Innocence Initiative is, is about to join us. So that's all. We thank you guys um, again, and um, we don't shrink from the battle. <laughs> that, that was the line that I took. We're going to keep fighting until we bring Chris and Lamont home, and then we're going to go back for more. So what we're going to do right now is we're just going to introduce the panel. Um, everybody's going to speak, but we're just going to do a, just a quick run through, share who we are, what we're doing here, our relationship to Lamont and Chris. Mine is simple. I'm the co-host and creator of the Strangest Fruit podcast. We met Lamont and Chris through Ray. Through that process, um, you know, we read a lot about the case. We saw all the inconsistencies. And we just know the men. Like I said before, I'm not a professional, but I know people. So just like, just like you, my, uh, there's no turning back. My heart's in it. We had amazing conversations with these beautiful families. I'm, I'm, we're locked in. Uh, like we're going to see this through all the way, and I'll pass it off. Um, Strangers Fruit Podcast co-host and Woo! creator. Uh, <laughs> this year, the longest-held political prisoner in the United States was released from prison. Show me. And he came to California, not knowing a thing, from the dirt roads of Louisiana. This man himself change case law, sentencing law, appellate law, the reason why we're allowed to have visits, the reason why we're allowed to have certain programs inside, he single-handedly changed that himself. And he was just now released from prison after being denied at the parole board 17 times. Only because of his age and his deteriorating health. And when I talked to Lamont, a few times I talked to Chris, it's, it's hard to catch him, he programmed him. <laughs> It's, it's, it's a hit and miss. Um, and when I talked to him, I asked him, I said, you know, where you at? When I see bro right here, it's like, you know, where's your number at today from 1 to 10? What's your number? How you feeling? What's your energy? 1 to 10. I'm 10. Brian, what's your energy? 1 to 10. I'm a 10. We had to learn these in self-help classes. We had to take gang anonymous, criminal anonymous. We had to go back to the square root of what it caused us to become who we are. Once again, I'm the guilty one in this. How does a person like Christopher Stone and Lamont Kellum answer those questions of how they've become who they are if they've never been who they've been convicted of? How does a person wake up every single day and face the reality of being oppressed every single day? In certain methods and schools and religions, they believe that oppression is worse than death because you get up going through that same hell consistently over and over again. It's Groundhog Day on the extreme negative. Every day, I'm seeing the same thing, same clothes, same smells. And I'm really sorry for your loss. But through your loss, something came through because every single dude that's came out of prison or you've seen the smells that you got from those letters. I walked down the street the other day and I smelled the musk of the prayer oil and I stopped in my tracks and I looked and I said, Hey, you such and such, and lo and behold, it's a dude that I had known my first celly in Juvenile Hall. I look into the crowd, I see my sworn enemy right there at one point, and now we're the best of friends. 
Lamont Kellum and me and myself, we're not supposed to be friends statistically. We're worse enemies. Me and Christopher Stone are even worse enemies than that. Statistically, because you look at blood and crip and that's what everybody sees. That's what been, what's been propagated about these men. They painted the picture of monsters. But if the roles were reversed and we went in there and painted the picture with his mother's words of your beautiful words about your brother, I guarantee you the outcome would have been drastically different. We breed bias. We create it. Our perception as human beings are just gone. We don't see the, the even path inside. One thing my teacher has taught me that came into prison and taught me how to be a dog behavioralist. She said, look at it from what it is, not what you think it is. And this is exactly what it is, wrong. Want to learn how to lynch a man without hanging him on a tree? Do it with a pen and paper. It's systematic. Um, so I thank you all again. This is everybody in here, Stranger Fruit Podcast. It wasn't even supposed to happen. I'm a dude that was sitting in solitary confinement. This dude did 14 years in there. What's the odds of a blood and an essay meeting up and saying, hey, Let's help other people that's supposed to be our enemies. It's a sign of the time. The question is, who's going to make the difference? Some people that are supposed to be here today, they're not here. But it's all right. Y'all just made us stronger. I appreciate it, though. Get an E for effort. Um, so thank you once again. And we're going to lead into the queen. Well, the queens and the kings up here. So we have um, next the mother of Christopher Stone. Um, yeah, just brief word. We'll do a little bit of Q&A after, but just a brief word why you're here today, what, what it's like. And this is the part, this is the, this is the part too. This lady doesn't want to have to come to a, a podcast studio and talk about her mom and have a bunch of eyeballs and be on YouTube. That, this, is not, this is not what she wants to do. This is a quiet lady that likes to be with her family and church and go, yeah so you know this is this is the hard part right here this is the hard part um thank you all for being here my name is crystal sterling chappelle um so i said i wasn't gonna cry <laughs> Um, I'm here because of my son, Christopher Lee Stone. Um, he's been gone for seven years. He's in Calipat State Prison um, for a crime he didn't commit. He was sentenced to um, 75 years. Oh. I really said I was going to be a big girl and I was going to be able to get it out. And, but seven years seems like seven minutes. Christopher is my only son. My only son. Everybody knows the bond we have. But growing up in Compton, you know, they said I go to church and I do all these things, but Growing up in an environment um, where you're either one thing or another, and I touched one thing or another, and God saw fit to bring me out. And when he brought me out, he brought my kids out. However, they had some attachments. I was good because he brought me out. So my son and my other two daughters, we grew up, you know, in Rancho and we moved out and we made it out. We made it out of the hood, right? And so Christopher loves football. From the age of six to incarceration, he played football. That was his out, that was his outlet. Um, and he was good at it. He had promises to go further. 
fast forward um, seven years ago, there was a crime committed in 2014. They picked Christopher up two years, three years later after this crime was committed. No forensics, no evidence, everything was circumstantial. It was February the 2nd when they picked him up. He had got off work, went to see his probation officer. They had the 77th precinct waiting for him. I was coming home from work. I got the phone call. And he said, Mom, <laughs> said, Mommy. He said I murdered somebody. I was in biology pizza place. I don't know how I got home or what happened. I just knew once they put that on you, it's hard, right? So I didn't know what I was up against. I was very ignorant and naive to this system, to how to fight. So basically, we were doomed before it got started. We paid so much money into attorneys and to end up with a public defender. Um, nothing wrong with public defenders. But the one we had was already under investigation. The DAs and the private investigator, they were already under investigation for wrongfulness. Because I was so broken, you know, I know a broken heart, but my heart was shattered. Shattered. That's why the pieces that are being put back together is, is what I speak out of strength. But my heart, still to this day, I cry every day. This is not a day that I don't cry. Um, anybody that has a family member that has been wrongly convicted, I urge you, I encourage you to fight. The last call I got before, after the conviction, um, I told him that I would fight to my last breath. What that looked like, I had no idea. I work for an organization that fights for men and women that are formerly incarcerated as well. Uh, Time for Change Foundation, Kim Carter is the ambassador of that program. And so every day that I fight and advocate for those ladies, I'm fighting for my son because the word of God said, what you do for others, he'll do for you. And so I try my best to do for others because I know how this came about. It's only God. I don't know anybody here. They don't know me. They met and encountered my son. That, um, that guy, that guy, yeah. That guy, he's somebody. He's somebody. He has four little girls. that I uh, keep together. All they know is their sisters. They're the Stone Sisters, that's what they call themselves. And they tight, because they know their dad is coming home one day. They know how to pray. They pray for their dad. So again, I don't know if I said anything that made any sense. But I thank you, I thank you to the podcast, to Ray, to Chip, to all the people that have came alongside of us. Christopher used to say, Mom, we got, we're a team. His sisters are stuck in traffic. <clears throat> but we, um, it's four of us. And I'm not saying I don't have other family members that love us and are supporting and praying for us. But Christopher and my two daughters and myself, every time one tap out, because it's been hard. 
when one tap out, the other one is able to take the rings. We have drove to San Diego to the Innocent Project and submitted paperwork and they said, no, you can't do that, you gotta mail it. We have driven, we have been on the radio, we have been on the news, we have been everywhere telling our story, sharing the story of Christopher Stone and the wrongful conviction. I pray um, that somebody hears, somebody fights, somebody helps to look at this case again and um, help to get my boy home. That's all I got, thank you. Amen, that's all I can say. Amen. Yeah, so up next we have the mother of Lamont Kellum, Junior. Junior. Yeah. Make sure you put that Junior on there. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just want to say to Stone's mom, everything you said made sense. And one thing I can say to you is that I live by, the just shall live by faith. There's nothing that God cannot do. It's going to bring our boys home. Hopefully they meet in it, but there's nothing he can't do. Um, I'm Lamont Callum Jr. mother. <laughs> I, we call him AJ. We call him Cho. Um, I'm just happy to be here. Um, for him, everything was just a mess. And I'm going to be really brief because I don't really like speaking. And I'm going to be brief. But um, one thing I do remember I was thinking about before I came here when, when he went to um, court. And I was saying, like, okay, this is going to be good because if they're in the same courtroom I'm in, this got to be good. I, or if they're hearing what I'm hearing, this is going to be good. Mm -hmm. I really didn't have no words, but I don't like court. I don't like the system because I know how injustice is. And um, I remember that night. And uh, they told us, you know, go home. It was a Friday. They said, you guys go home. The jury can't come up with a um, verdict. You guys go home. We'll be back Monday. We left, me and my family left, I'll never forget. And I went to drop um, one of my cousins off to the arms where she was living at the time. And then on my way leaving, I remember my son calling me, he was like, mom. And I'm like, what's wrong, son, I'm driving home. He said, do you know they just called me back in and said that um, the verdict was guilty. I'm like, what? They just told us to come home, is that legal? He had no family there. When they gave him the guilty verdict, we were driving home. We just left the court building, it was 4.45 maybe. How did that happen when two other jurors said she could not come up with, the, with a verdict? But that's why I say that to say this. He had no family there when that happened. Um, I love my son. My son going to come home one day. And I, uh, what you got up there said, I always pray that. I don't want to ever have to get that call about my baby. Lord knows. So that's why I pray a lot. And, and I remember I was on a prayer line and somebody, um, they prayed, it was like, Chastity, um, your son in prison? I said, yeah. They said, it's a man. <laughs> they said, it's a man he's going to meet. I'm like, okay. You know, sometimes we believe, sometimes we don't, you know, because what we're going through. But he said, it's a man he's going to meet. And this was a year prior to me even knowing anything about rape. And he said, it was a man he's going to meet, and that man is going to help him come home. And that's why I, it, it's not that I'm taking everything lightly. I already know what's going to happen. Same thing for her son. I already know what's going to happen. I have five children and we live by strength. That's the only thing that is keep us. And that's why my son is so strong because I raised him on strength. Even as a single mother, I raised him on strength. I raised him on believing in God. And no matter what, my son is so different today than he was when he first went in. I didn't know who that kid was, but today, my baby is so mature. He's so happy. He had peace. When he called now, he said, hey, lady. But usually when he called, he'd be like, you know, mom, what's wrong with you, dude? Lift your head up and let me see your spirit. And that's what he's doing now. So I'm happy for that. Um, they even had, a, he, he, he didn't have no GSR, none of that on him. They got him for gang enhancements. I think he got more than stone. More than, I think he had like 80 some or even life. You know, and I thank God for that. We went through lawyers. The first lawyer emptied out the bank account. The second lawyer, thank God for his uncle. He, he came through. This is what we do, and we try to get them home, and we just steady being pushed to the side, but they're taking our money. So I'm glad for the, um, these young men. I'm happy for you young men. And it's not that I, I'm strong now. 
I used to cry like that all the time. It's been 10 years for my boy, 10 whole years for my boy. And, and I thank God that he is still, you know, here with us. Because like she said, it's a lot of them that don't make it out. But I praise God on today that our boys are going to make it out. I praise God he's going to give them all the resources that they need, these young men that's doing this. His uncle paid the lawyer, what, like 28000 We ain't never got in no thing right here with books and pictures, all you people recording. I don't think I even been, never met the man. Then you guys come in, haven't asked for a penny, and willing to help the boys. So I'm just happy today. I, I, I'm, I'm smiling because I'm happy. I'm happy. And I, I just want to be here for her. She's so emotional, but he going to do it. He going to do it. I used to be like that. I'm telling you, it took a lot for me. I'm so strong now. People say, do she have emotions? I do have emotions. I go in the bathroom and let out my emotions, come back out like superwoman. Hey, son, how you doing? He say, hey, lady. I love my boy, but I got these other kids. You see the mother ones back there? His sisters. I can't let them see me be, you know, but you cry all you want to. I'm right here because I did it for 10 years in silence. I did it. But we have to let the world know that please help us. We need help, and they're helping us. And, you know, my son was one. He, he had no GSR on him, no nothing. If you guys look up the case, please read it. You're going to be like, what is this? How? And then you convict my baby without his family present? You told us to go home, but yet you come back with a guilty verdict? That's not right. That's, that's insane. So I'm happy for all you here. Keep your head up, sweetheart. You touched my heart, young lady. I was like, oh, yes, keep your head up. Keep your head up and whatever you can do in honor of your brother. Do it for your brother in honor of for wrongful convictions, because it's, so, it's many. It's just not our son. It's many, 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 many. So I'm just grateful for you. I'm going to pray for you, for your strength, you and your sister. Keep doing well. And I'm just, I'm telling y'all, I'm strong, real strong. I didn't used to be, but now I'm strong. And, you know, I love all you guys. Keep helping us. I can't wait for my baby to come home. I had a dreamy pick me up off my feet. I'm going to be happy. Pick me up. Just don't drop me. <laughs> But I want my baby home. I just want to say thank you to his uncle for being here. <laughs> his godmother is here, too. Like you said earlier, that, stuck, that touched my heart. People were supposed to be here who didn't come. But people hear that God wanted to be here. The word will be heard. So y'all know I love God. I've been talking about God all day. Let me be quiet. But I'm happy. You guys continue to pray for me and my family as I pray for yours, as we continue to be strong. Because it's a hurtful thing to know your baby and there ain't nothing you can do about it. You know how when they little, you can help them if they scrape their knee. There's nothing I can put on my son's wound right now. But to keep answering those calls, to keep sending what he needs, to keep answering, you gotta ask because they need that. Don't stop answering. Don't stop, you know, checking in on how they're doing. They got this, this tablet now, you have no excuse. There you go, right there, he right yeah. there. Y'all see Lamont right there? He's on the tablet, he's right there on the tablet. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but y'all, I'm encouraged. You be encouraged. Be encouraged. We got this. We got this. We got this. Thank you. <laughs> All right, we'd like to introduce the wife of AJ. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they call him. <laughs> My name is Sue Kellum. I'm here on behalf of Lamont. It's a lot. This is a this is a hard. This is a hard. This is a, a very hard battle to fight. You know, like, and then it's just I took it upon myself to study his case. I literally stay up day in and day out, night. I have a busy schedule. I work a nine to five, and then I also my son is in extracurriculum. So my day I'm on the road literally with his transcripts, studying his case finding every inconsistency there is, and it's a lot. So I also want to say, when you go and Google his name, you find the prosecution's theory. Mm -hmm. So when you read it, based off of, it's, everything is based off of their theory. It's not, when I go and look back at the transcript, it does not match. It's a lot of inconsistencies in there. 
but I just know that I'm a part of this journey. I know I was put here for a reason. I'm very determined, and I know that he's going to come home. Yeah. Just with Lamont, I'm here to help support Chris I'm, yes. and so on and so forth. Whoever else, I want to be a part of Confidence Innocence Initiative, and I am. I do my own. Reached out to the Andre's mayors. <laughs> and I'm going to be here to support him, bring him home along with everyone else. All right. Oh, yeah. Mr. Frankie Carrillo. They brought out the big guns and they got Frankie in here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, Congressman Carrillo. Yeah. Future Congressman Carrillo. Maybe now? Here you go. I'm used to sitting in the back of the room, so I know that the guys in the back can barely hear what was going on. So this is why I got the mic, guys. I want to make sure that everyone can hear us. So my my, uh, my name is Frankie Carrillo. I am the policy director, as my boss, Paula Mitchell, pointed out, from the Los Angeles Innocence Project. And I'm grateful to be here. I'm an exonery out of Linwood, so Compton Linwood in the house, neighboring cities. My story dates back to 1991, when I was a 16-year-old boy wrongfully accused, tried as an adult on the conveyor belt of justice that ended up with the wrongful conviction and an extremely long sentence. Um, and that was supposed to be the end of it. I'm going to skip all the details about what the crime was about because it's irrelevant at this point. But the main thing was that the system was intending for me to be devoured by the prison experience. The system was expecting me to um, not fight back for everyone who believed in me to give up. Um, tattoos, ball head, whatever else they're expecting of me on the inside. And that was a journey that I'm here to talk to you guys about. But before I go there, I want to just, uh, to the mothers and family, I am, I am extremely moved and I'm crying on this side of the table because I'm envisioning what my family was going through while I was in prison. I'm trying to use your experience and ask myself, is this is this what how they cried as well? Is this how they were strong as well? And um, the answer is yes. And to know that the problem continues, you know, a lot of a lot of um, this is for people at this point. You would assume that when a case like mine or other folks who've been wrongly convicted get exposed, that someone would say, oh, oh we got to fix it. It's a problem. We have to prevent these things from happening again. But obviously, that's not the case. So to know that someone who's been, who's been arrested since I've been out, um, it, it's really bothersome. You know, there was talk about, and, and I'm a make it very short because I don't think it's going to be a Q&A, so I don't want to take up too much time, but I'll just say one thing. There was mention about people who were supposed to be here who didn't show up. And I think that that's a theme that you will, we will experience in this movement. People who we expect to be. You know, you would imagine you know, after being out for 12 years of just to put me behind me. I don't want to forget. I want to use my story to give hope, but it, it's hurt. it hurts to just repeat it out loud. But my point is that, you know, for 20 years, I was on the inside hoping and praying, right? And for me, I thought I was going to write the perfect letter. That was going to get someone's attention and they would come to my rescue. 
and that's not what happened. I was in Folsom Prison, and I worked for a woman named Tony Carter, who was a teacher. And when she, when she retired, when she retired, I asked her to do me a favor. The favor was basically, will you share my story? When you went through now retiring and living your life, will you share my story? And so she said she would. And Tony Carter was invited six months later. She was invited to a book signing, just a random event. Today, right? It's an event that was going to bring people together. And Tony, she 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 had read the book. She had heard the, the author speak. For her, it would have been kind of a waste of time to show up, but she still showed up. And when she showed up, she met a woman who was an attorney. And the attorney happened to announce that she was a lawyer, and then Tony made it happen. She was my messenger. So at that event. As she showed up to, she shared my story with this attorney, and in my story, the, the, the rest is history. The attorney came to my rescue and freed now, right? Exactly. But but my point to, to the mothers and to everyone in the room, divine purpose for the divine moment, and I want to just share my, my, uh, my support as well. Whatever I can do, sign me up as well, man. I think that um, I, I also wasn't going to show up. I'll be honest with you guys. It's been a long day. It was something drew me. Like, I, I got to show up. This is the case about wrongful conviction. This is my jam. Then we'll talk to them thinking, oh, man, these are my people. I'm support them. I think, right? And I showed up. And I'm grateful that I did. So, uh, so are we. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to introduce you guys to Jared. Jared Villery. Council member Jared. <laughs> Going to be a lawyer. Who knows, yeah. one day. Well, um, so yeah, my name's Jared Villery. I spent 20 years inside on a crime I didn't commit. I committed a crime, not what I was accused of. Unfortunately, rich college kids who didn't want to admit to drug dealing turned it into a robbery from a drug deal. I'm 20 years later, and um, I've been out a little bit less than five months. And yeah, it's a, it's a trip. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> but the nature, so, so fighting is what I do. And the fact that I'm involved in this speaks to the lack of resources, the, the lack of involvement from lawyers. I spent 18 of those 20 years litigating and fighting against the system pen and paper and a typewriter. <laughs> you know, hundreds, thousands of pages, cross-legged on a bunk in a prison cell, fighting the system. Um, going without packages to buy log books, to learn everything I could on my own and teach myself the law. Because I knew that I was never gonna get out just sitting there. Um, I was never gonna, I didn't expect help. Lawyers fail you. They take the money and they fail you. They don't fight the way that they're meant to. And, you know, during that time, I learned just how broken the system is. Seeing innocence, how I know Carly, I worked on her brother's case for seven years. Never charged anything. That was something. Um, I did it because of what was, it's what was right, right? That was the whole thing. And that's something I became really passionate about. And not being able to get Ryan out was one of the things that, it almost made me give up on the law because the system is so broken. There's no accountability. You have prosecutors in a system, the most powerful player in the system, and there's no accountability. They can suppress evidence. They cannot tell you anything about what they know of uh, uh, that exonerates you, exculpatory evidence, they call it. And there's no repercussions. There are federal laws in place that significantly hinder one's ability to challenge their conviction after the fact. It's easy to get in. It's almost impossible to get out. They, you know, <laughs> it takes lawyers decades to become professionals and they give you a single year to go to federal court and fight your conviction on your own without an appointed attorney. And so sitting in there fighting, winning, 
beating the system, beating the prison system, um, I found my purpose. You know, it was a, it was a messed up way to, but um, I found what I'm most passionate about. And it was kind of serendipitous. Carly's sweetheart that she is, she goes back into the prisons and she met Chris and she knows how I am. And she's like, there's this case that you might find interesting if you have time. And I'm working on six cases and college classes, all that type of stuff. But um, I was like, yeah, innocent case? Yeah, yeah, I got to you know, let me hear about it. And the more you dig into it, you have tainted identification. You have a single witness whose brother shows a picture. She's aware of somebody who follows them on social media for a year and a half before she comes forward with an identification. And then only after that tainted identification do two other people identify someone. And that's the only evidence. I mean, this is, it's a broken system. There's so many people in there I've come across. I've worked on a lot of cases because, you know, I'm the last resort, the, the guy in there who's gonna help somebody that doesn't cost money, you know, and, and because lawyers are exhausted. And it's just a shame, you know, you come and you see so many people languish in prison and, and it's easy to give up. It's easy to get when you're locked in a concrete box 23 hours a day, or you're in isolation in the hole in the shoe for months, years on end, it's easy to want to give up. And, you know, the fact that Lamont and Chris are still fighting, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it speaks uh, to the strength of, uh, you know, the human will. You know, that's something that is indomitable. And it's, but it takes help, it takes networking, it takes resources, unfortunately. Yeah, you know, so my involvement, I, can only, I can't practice law yet. One of these, you know, law school is on the horizon in the next couple of years. Um, already got several college degrees in prison. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and, you know, it's, this is my passion. This is what I'm passionate about. It's not, a, you know, money doesn't really matter so much. It's with doing what you love and fighting for what's really right in the system where very few do. Very few are willing to step up and fight for what's right. You know, it's all about the money. Lawyers, can't stand a lot of lawyers. I'm gonna be one, but I can't stand them all, you know, just to be honest. And it, you know, it's, it's a shame that that's, that's how it is. You know, it's, you know, you reach out to Innocence Project after Innocence Project and they turn it down because there's no DNA evidence. You know, and, and this is the biggest, one of the biggest flaws in the system is the reliance on eyewitness identification evidence. It's so flawed. The memory is not a video. That's, that's just what it is, but the juries are, are believe that because someone be, believes strongly that that's the person that did it, they accept it. And they're wrong more often than the justice system would like us to believe but they don't want us to believe that because then it throws a, a wrench in their system. You know, 98% of cases are resolved through plea bargains. That's not a trial system. That's a conviction system. You know, I mean, prosecutors aren't disciplined, so they get away with it. You know, there was, uh, um, between 97 and 09, there were over 700 instant instances of prosecutorial misconduct found in California alone and only six prosecutors were disciplined. You can't sue them. There's no repercussions, so they keep doing this, you know. And that's just knowing all of these things. You know, I spent 18 of the 20 years inside studying the law, fighting civil rights, federal habeas, all the post-conviction, and trying to be the last bastion of hope for guys in there who, who had no more hope. You know, and so this is this is my calling. This is my mission. It was serendipity. You know, Carly just happened to go to Calipat. I just happened to connect with an investigator in Canada who I began working with a few weeks before, and now we're investigating every lead possible, whether it's forensics, whether it's everything that a lawyer should have done from the very beginning, and that's what we're trying to do. 
to, so that we can bring it to an innocence project and do all the legwork. I don't even we've got to do 90% of the work just to get it over the threshold. You know, there's a lot of there are a lot of changes that have happened in California that make getting back into court more of a reality. Not enough, but there are changes. And so, I don't know. It's my hope. The comp I'm blessed to be part of the Compton Innocence Initiative to be the launch of something. This is something for years. Even with all the successes I had, I always wondered if my skill set, my work would ever be recognized, you know, and whether I would just be viewed as just another convict who, who was disgruntled with the system. And uh, it's nice to, for all of that work to mean something, to be able to put it to good work, to, to good use now that I'm out, you know, and so that's, that's pretty much where I come from. You know, that's, that's how I'm involved, and I just really look forward to getting them both out, working on getting them both, get, you know, getting the evidence and getting it in the court and fighting. You know. Best lawyer ever. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> one day. One day. One day. <laughs> I want to thank everybody for sharing. We're going to have a Q&A briefly as well. No, I just wanted to say the stories of Chris Stone and Lamont Kellum Jr., We've done them at length on the Strangest Fruit podcast, so watch it, share it. Um, they're amazing stories. I don't know, my heart is full right now. It... Well, before we go to the Q&A, can I ask everybody in here, who in here believes that they're normal? That they're normal. Who in here believes that they're just normal? Definitely not me. That's the question. That's, that's, that's a... That was a simple that was a simple question, but that was a big ass question. Who in here believes that they're normal? You believe that you're normal? Possibly? You don't believe that. You don't believe that. Exactly. I mean, you get up, you do the same thing every day. You don't do anything outside of your schedule. To the store, point A, point B and back. That's it. That's all. That's all of it. No abstract thinking. When I talked to Lamont the other day, I was like, what's going on, bro? Because I, I had to get the hell out of California. I thought maybe I need to go to Vegas for a pit stop. Got to Vegas. This shit stressed me out. There's too many people. The light's too bright. It's overrated. Bums running around here. I just use it for a place to sleep. I said, I need to get away from more people. It's too much. The world is too much. Jump back in the car, drove to Utah. Slept in a national park in a car. Why? The world is too much. I, I need to get away. Let me hop in the car and drive some more. Drove way to the, to the Grand Canyon. Got to the edge at the Grand Canyon, one of the, the brightest, the longest peaks. If I fall, I'm dead by, you know, just a little speck of, of anything. And then I could breathe again. This is what it took for me to feel right. And then ask yourself, where are we at in our mental health? And I mentioned that to Lamont the other day, like, bro, I had to, where you at? You at a one or you at a 10? He's like, man, I'm at like a five right now. I said, nah, champ, I need you at a 10, bro, because if I got to be at a 10, you're going to be at a 10 too. But it's the, the mutual relationship that we have for each other, for him to be like, I respect that. I'm, I'm, I'm going to get where I need to be. Because you need me at a 10. I need to exchange that energy. So that's why I ask, who's in here normal? Christopher Stone isn't normal. Lamont Kellum is not normal. We had a big laugh in here with Bird, and then we like we said, man, where did you get the name Cholo from? The average person with a basic perspective would say, oh, that's a gang member's name. Cholo, transliteration in Spanish. Gangster, wow. Then I asked his sister, where did your brother get that name from? And it was his little sister that gave him the name. It wasn't a gang name. That's not normal. The perspective isn't either. Sometimes you need to stand on top of the world and look down just to get a, the right view of what it is or where you need to see. Or abstract, turn it every which way, you're going to see a different part of the picture and a part of the puzzle. So I'll ask, you think about it, go home and ask yourself, are you normal? You ask your kids, who's the youngest person in here? She might not. <laughs> she might not. That's my mama's perspective. She says she's 21, she's 50 something. Mentally or physically? <laughs> uh, physically, hey, either or. 
Let's ask. Young lady. Young lady. Both of y'all, what do you want to be when you grow up? Oh, paramedic. What do you want to be when you grow up? Paramedic and a nurse. Okay. At the times that we're at right now, we don't got a lot of nurses and a lot of paramedics. Everybody want to be a dope dealer or Instagram model. <laughs> That's not normal. They naturally just, hey, I want to go and I want to care for people. I want to make sure people are right. Their mom's taught them that. And then what Madam here said when we had the interview about there need to be the structure, it needs to be the men in the household. We can't protect our communities or do anything like that if we sit in the damn jail all day. Me and my girl rode through Compton the other day. We was on, what was that, Long Beach Boulevard? It was tearing that Instacart up, you heard me? We rode through there, and I noticed it. On my periphery, I said, yeah, the police looking down at the, the sheriff looking down at the thing. Like, what? I said, no, the, the sheriff is looking down. He on me. I said, what you mean? You, you're just driving. Everything's up to par. I said, nah, you got to know where you at. So we drive. I said, he hit us with the cherries. Let me go ahead and turn and make a left. Right in front of the Bank of America. I said, don't trip. Just throw your hands out the car. Just throw them out. Don't even, don't even make, it look, make it look effortless. Just throw them out. You throw yours, I throw mine, and we just going to chill. So he started walking up, and she got to see what the gang life within the cops are like. Because in order to catch the bad guys, you have to do what? Be like them, walk like them, talk like them. You know, it's funny that the cop that we invited to be here, ex-LAPD, who was on a case, one of the biggest scandals in Los Angeles police history, we needed him a day and he didn't show up. You know, but that's, that's amongst other people. Y'all mentioned me, mentioned Andre Spicer, yes. I, I'll go to your office down there in Compton and talk to you about Andre Spicer. You know, I don't care about that player. You know, but um, you see a perspective like never before because the cop walked up and the first word that came out of his mouth was, what's up, G? Where you from? I haven't been banged on like that since 2006. <laughs> like, he got at me like, like, you know, like, like, like he want to test that. Like, we might have to hit a side alley. You know what I'm talking about. The, where you from? Yeah, he was chest out. Exactly. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You know what I'm saying? But no, literally 2006. You know what I'm saying? So he walked up to the car and I said, you know, just, just chill. It's good. Where are you from? He looked at my tattoos. You supposed to be over here? You got any dope or you got guns? Baby, not knowing. She's like, well, here go the insurance. He said, I don't want that. <laughs> But all the tags match. I'm not worried about that. Hold on, you stay right here. Keep, matter of fact, roll down the back windows in case I gotta shoot through here. I don't have nothing that's gonna stop this bullet. Went to the car, ran the stuff. He came back, said, oh, you good? I said, man, I don't even have a license. He know I had no license on me. You supposed to follow all this, but it's not, it's not for her. It's not for a traffic stop. What is he here for? He here for me. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world in some people's eyes. And for the young people here, I apologize on behalf of some of the adults that you're going to run into into your life that pose a picture of perfection that are far from that. It's most likely you're going to see the people with the flaws, the, the cholos with the tattoos and, you know what I'm saying, the guys that got that certain limp in their walk that's going to move different. It's going to be those guys. It's going to be the times where we have these unusual acquaintances. So when I sit down with my teacher and she explained to me something, she told me to picture her and her mother. Lady flew, flew 17 hours from Brazil and came here. And she told me the story about another woman, a strong woman, a woman of color that's over there in Brazil where in a bar, 20 men, 20 men were gunned down by the police. And one of these young men stood, stood about six foot seven this goes to show corruption. It's not just, it's a Compton everywhere. It's a Flavola in Brazil everywhere. The only difference between Brazil and America is that over there, they don't care who sees it because this is where we're at. What America does, we paint the squeaky clean to perfection and we tell the whole world we don't do anything wrong. Our justice systems are flawed. It'll probably be 100, 200 years, 300 years before it changes. That's the battle I'm here for. That's the battle Lamont's here for. He said the other day, man, I want to change the world, bro. Uh, uh, a gang member from Compton says he wants to change the world. 
There's a gang member from Compton right now that says we need to start thinking about men's mental health. People with incarcerated mental health. This is, y'all get where I'm going with this? So we're changing the narrative. They want us to be the monsters, they want us to be the gangsters, but we're changing the narrative no matter what. I had to change my narrative. I couldn't come in here with the khaki suit on, as bad as I wanted to. As bad as I want, I want to come in here with a blunt in my mouth and all this stuff here and kick my feet up. But no, it's a time and a place. And we get in a position where you need to move up and step it up a notch. So I had to sit down and study the cases. I had to figure this, I had to ask questions. I had to sit down with a cop who I know did so many things wrong for many, many years. Got a lot, he admitted himself, look at the interview. Got a lot of my people locked up, some of y'all people locked up. And I had to sit down and say, look bro, let's come with a parallel and have an unusual acquaintance. I need you to tell me what it takes to be the worst and baddest cop that there could ever be. What does it take for you mentally to change your mind and say, hey, I'm going to kill a man. I'm going to frame a person. I'm going to derail your life's path for eternity if you let me. I have to ask that question. Then I have to turn around and tell his mom, his family, his kids, this is what it is. The picture that they're painting is all wrong. Then I have to fight with America. Why? Because they say, hey, this is what it is. We're squeaky clean and you're a big old lie. Why? Because you're a felon and you'll never be anything. And you'll always be a slave to the system. You can be president of the United States, though. Right? Yeah. Good one. And I like them loafers. <laughs> but Lamont's back here. I did this for you, bro. We came together. This is going to be something amazing. It's going to be something amazing. Nobody in here is normal. I'm going give to give it to you just like that. Nobody, this is going to be something that you'll be sitting down. Stay up late, Nate. Stand up. Hey. From day one, from day one, that man right there has been like, look, I'm, a, I'm part of this. What, what are we going to do? Frankie Carrillo, bro, this, this is like, like just, Sue? Yeah, Sue, was, she hit me up. Yeah, y'all, y'all got us. The other day, Sue, I said, I said, Sue, you ready? You got it. I ain't never did this before. I said, well, look, act like this is the last speech you ever going to give me day in your life. Like, act like this. Act like this is it. This, there's no other thing. That's it. That's all. Because that's what Lamont's going to have to do when they go back to court. That's what he had to do when he went to the parole board. And we're not doing no begging. We, we're not going to do no begging. If we got to fight, that's all I do. But, hey, let's do it. We're going to fight all the way to the end. Ray, all this by that man right there. And look, he never tries to accept any credit or anything, but real quick before we go to the Q&A, I forgot how many years ago, I don't know, before I even came on to this, I just walked into the studio one day and Brian was like, man, get him on the mic. I'm like, I don't even need no mic. We're just going to do this. I thought I was freestyling in there. I, I thought I was in there like Tupac. Who won't it? You know? And uh, I sat down with a young man and um, he was surprised at, at the stuff, the combo that we were having because about a half hour into this conversation, he was like, you know, well, you know, I'm from 18th Street. Where are you from? And I laughed and I was like, only if you knew. And then he would later find out where I was from. And he was like, you know, this is crazy that you are blood and you talking to me? And I was like, little baby, when you grow up, things change. You know, you, you transition. You know, ask your big homie, do they kids go to the schools that, your, that you go to or that your kids went to? No, nah, they go to private school. So that's, that should let you know where you lie in a level of respect and understanding from the people that's supposed to be teaching you the right things. If your kid's going to a regular school and the person that you look up to with all the millions of dollars and their kid's not going to school with you, but they telling you to do all the type of stuff that is not right, look at where they value. After that, I never heard from that young man again. He left the studio. We had a whole program going. But I provided him with the truth, and that's all that I could do. But Ray did something. I learned something a lot with this case, a lot. We reached out to so many people. So I got mad so, I don't know how many people y'all, I got mad. Like I got mad like I was ready to squabble. 
Like I was, if y'all know the squabble word, fight. I was ready. Because when you hit up so many people and you're like, look, man, we have this, we have this, we have this. I call it the perfect recipe. So I know what we got to come with. I've been studying it so long. See, you got to have the politic. You got to have the celebrity. You got to have the funding. You got to have the main key, the people. And you got to have the people that's going to provide the truth, the speakers. I can get up here and say whatever and people can hate me for it, but as long as I gave you the truth, oh well. I'm content with my life. I'm not here for the millions. But when we reached out to so many nonprofits, these mega organizations, one guy said, hey, y'all gonna pay me? I gotta pay you to do something right. Brother, you need help with your career. That's what we doing. But I, I stayed quiet. Why? Because it's not beneficial for Chris and Lamont. As bad as I wanna lash out and say, you, 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 I can't do it. It's not beneficial. But I also told him, bro, you're going to see who your friends are at the end of it all. Like we all had to do when we were sitting in that prison cell. He had life. He had life. He had 20-some years. It took a dude who doesn't know anything about gang life driving down the streets of L.A. after getting it over 60 different nonprofits, celebrities, judges, district attorneys to stumble across Nipsey Hussle in a gas station on his birthday. Him and Black Sam. So he said, you know what, why not? Let me just holler at this dude. Look, I got this organization. I got this idea where I want to help people in prison with creative arts, with changing their life, with learning how to write movies, whatever it is. Before he could finish this conversation, Nipsey Hussle and Black Sam said, say less. We're on board. And that's how this happened. Unusual acquaintances. People that are not normal. Somebody that's going to say, I'm just going to ask you a question. What's the worst you can say? No. Let's not be normal. And let's go on to this Q&A. It's going to be nice. All right, so we're five minutes after nine. Um, I just wanted to uh, close with just a short thing. Um, what it looks like after you come home, you know, what, what's the, the possibilities. My favorite quote is by Nelson Mandela. In my country, you go to prison, and then you become president. I love that. So once you come home, once justice is served, um, the possibilities of what that looks like, I would like to ask Frankie Carrillo to share what it looks like following coming home. After that, we're, we have some raffle tickets for some artwork that was done by um, incarcerated people. We encourage you you know, get involved, buy a ticket, and um, we'll yeah. close out after that. There's a really cool um, Cal State LA, that, th that, that background, it's like right there where the food was at. So like we'll take a bunch of pictures and, and you know help help blow this up. Get those Compton Initiative shirts. I want to see them Compton shirts yeah. everywhere. Yeah. But in closing, what are the lifers, innocent people after years come home? The possibilities. What does your life look like today, Frankie? What are you up to? What are you doing? Yeah. Well, you know, you know, Brian. Thank you for that question. And Ray, Chip, D, everybody who's here. You know. I'm, I'm gonna use this, this normal, I'm gonna keep with that theme of being normal. I was about to be normal when I came home, but, but I don't think that, that I qualify for it. So, you know, when I came home, I went straight to school. I had uh, friends and family who was, were, um, looked out for me, showed me love and, and cared for me, reminded me that I was human and that I mattered. And uh, I started getting involved in politics. I started getting involved in, in knowing what it felt like just to be out and about. Um, I went to Philadelphia soon after I got out at a conference, and the conference was about what do we do after an incarceration? Systemically, what happens? And to my surprise, they had aerospace, like NASA was there, and they had the medical world was there, and they had the criminal justice people there as well. And they used the NASA folks and said, when a plane goes down anywhere in the world, you're looking for the black box. You want to find out exactly what happened so we can prevent it from ever happening again. The medical world said, when there's instruments left in, in people's bodies during operations, we now have QR codes to make sure that there's an inventory before they zip somebody up and they make sure these operations um, uh, are, are designed to end the way they're supposed to, no, no human error. And when the acts of people in the realm of criminal justice, what happens after wrongful conviction, they had no response. Their response was, 
uh, sort of like they just kind of looked at each other and were kind of blaming internally, but there was no systemic response about how we can prevent these things from happening. And I took that back to California and it really, it really framed the way I lived my life after that. I, I today am a commissioner here in the county. I am the policy advisor for the, the Los Angeles Innocence Project. I'm on the board of the DA's office. I have a family. I live a great life. I got a show on Netflix. I won a multi-million dollar lawsuit against the sheriff's department. And still, after seeing all that, nothing has changed, people. That's the sad part about it. On a systemic level, a lot of great things are happening, but on a systemic level, we're still hearing these sad stories about wrongful conviction. There's been some echoing about me running for public office, and I am. I feel that until somebody with a story like mine, a story like ours, is at the table sharing lived experience about how the system that we all rely on is letting some people down, I think not until then will the system have a chance to reform itself from the inside out, and we can all benefit from that. So I'm grateful to say that I could have been normal with the multi-millions that I got and left the country and, and been at some island somewhere, but shame on me for even considering that. I want to be here in the fight. I want to make sure that these men and, and women come home and that um, whatever I can do to help on a, on a systemic level, running for public office and winning is, is the idea, and to remind people on a state level and, and across the country that they have to stop treating us this way and that we matter and our families matter. And so that's what I've been up to since I've been home. Yeah. <laughs> A podcast called Strangest Fruit.